Assalamu alaikum. This is your brother, Donnell Muhammad, a student in the ministry class under the divine professorship of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Welcome once again to another installment of a program called My Walk with Jesus as a Muslim. We thank Almighty God Allah for his intervention in our affairs. We thank him for coming in person, searching among us, finding one worthy among us in the first instance in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank this one God yet again for not leaving us comfortless, but for giving us a leader, a teacher, a guide, a brother, and a true friend in the leadership of the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet my brothers, sisters, friends and guests in our nation greeting of peace of Islam alaikum. We have a star studded program for you this evening. We will be interviewing a brother, a friend, a soldier, a principal with a stellar record, a student minister in the ministry class of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who was unjustly blatantly and defiantly let loose from Lynn Bloom High School as the principal there with a track record that is so extensive, I will leave that to him to explain. With that said, we want to have a brief overview of this man and his record, and Brother Stephen Muhammad will show you this clip. Let's go to the clip. Some students plan to be at the local school council meeting tonight in West Englewood to demand the principal of Lindblom High School be reinstated. Abdul Muhammad was removed as principal in March. His supporters claim staff members made false statements during a CPS investigation. Now, one of the cases involves the release of Abdul Muhammad back in March. He was the principal at Lindblom Math and Science Academy. At the time, CPS would only say he was released due to an investigation that substantiated findings against him, but there were no specifics. CPS had the same response when they released Hyde Park Academy's principal, Antonio Ross, last spring. CPS refusing to comment on personnel matters. Now, the shakeup sparking some protests in each school community with parents and students demanding more answers. People who know me know that I can sometimes have an ego. I thought I was the best principal in Chicago's history. I always, you look at my emails, it says most awarded principal, right? It says principal of the number one neighborhood school. I thought I was the best. And then I met Abdul Muhammad. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't occur to me immediately. Thank you, Troy. I'm not playing. Those who know me know it takes a lot to get me to a point where I say I done found someone better than I think I am. <laughs> and it didn't occur to me immediately. Just the more I heard from his story, everywhere he goes. Black students' achievement rises. Right. Wow. Everywhere he goes, right. climate and culture gets transformed wow. from fights every day to peace in the hall. Everywhere he goes, and the thing that, everywhere he goes, graduation rates go up. And the thing that finally hit me about him is why everywhere he goes, you so see those things. It dawned upon me that this man loves black children yeah, yeah. and that everything he does comes from that love. Brothers and sisters, please give it up for Mr. Abdul Muhammad. Yeah. 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 We can hear you. Can you all hear me? We can hear you, brother. Good morning. Good morning. In the same district where an ordinance was passed in 1863 that prevented black children and white children from going to the same school. Uh -huh. The same district that put black children in Willis wagons. Yeah. The same district mm. that issued that was issued a consent decree by the federal government to desegregate schools, and the schools still are not desegregated. Right. The same district 
that worked against Jackie Vaughn yeah. right here in Chicago. Yeah. Uh -huh. The same district that systematically fired black teachers and were sued and had to pay the black teachers. Yeah, yeah. The same district that closed over 50 schools yeah. in the black community. Yes, the same district that uh, closed Diet High School uh -huh. and didn't reopen it until the community members went on a hunger strike for 34 days. Yeah. The same district that fought against Karen Lewis. Yes, sir. Yeah. The same district is now waging their war of anti-blackness against the black principals yeah. in Chicago Public Schools. Explain. If does anybody have any doubt if given an opportunity to have due process that Abdul Muhammad would not be immediately put back in his position of educating the black children in the city of Chicago. Instead of attacking him, they should be celebrating this brother. That's what they should be doing, celebrating this brother. I'm sorry, Troy. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, if our brother is online, we would like to bring him on at this time. Principal, brother, friend, father, husband, my brother, your brother, my friend, brother principal, student minister, Abdul Muhammad. Drum roll, please. Brr, no, assalamu alaikum, my brother. Wa alaikum salam, my brother. Thank you for having me on the show. I want to oh, always. We said we were going to have you again, and here you are. And all praise is due to Allah. I'm glad to be here. I uh, definitely thank you for the opportunity. Thank your team. Uh, thank your your family, your wife, the believers, and uh, of course, thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for teaching me, because I would be nothing to speak of if I had not been taught by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I'm not going to be a silent witness of the transformative work that God has blessed the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to do. So I thank you all for having me uh, on your show tonight. Yes, sir, my brother. A few questions, of course, that you can feel free to ask and answer. One of them is, tell us who you are, what gives you purpose, what are you passionate about that drives and motivates you? Thank you, my brother. So uh, as many of your listeners know, I'm Abdul Muhammad, student minister in the Nation of Islam. I've been an educator uh, in the city of Chicago for uh, 30 years. Uh, 25 of those years have been in Chicago public schools. I worked at Muhammad University of Islam. Uh, that was my first uh, education uh, teaching job was at Muhammad University of Islam in Chicago and uh, graduated from HBCU Southern University in Baton Rouge and um, came to Chicago to serve our children in the city of Chicago. And, you know, brother Donnell, when I was in college, like most of us, I did not know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. Like most young people, we're confused. We're figuring out. And, and part of life is figuring out the path that you are to walk down. Uh, that's part of the journey of life. <clears throat> and on that journey, I was blessed to come into the nation of Islam and get some sense as uh, most of us didn't have any before we came in the nation. And while I was in college, I decided to major in education. I didn't know at that time that education would end up being my passion, but education is my absolute passion. So I graduated from Southern, came to Chicago, started working in the field of education, and shortly thereafter, I became the teacher of the year in the city of Chicago. I was nominated twice for the Golden Apple Award. The Golden Apple is the highest honor that a teacher can receive. So I was nominated twice for the Golden Apple and um, in 2004 and 2007. And I was teacher of the year uh, for the city of Chicago. When I won the teacher of the year award, the... Um, Mayor, you had a picture right there. Mayor Daly invited me to City Hall uh, for the ceremony where they honored the winners of that particular award. And, um, you know, they issued a proclamation and all of those those nice things that they do uh, when you receive that type of honor. I was also 
featured in who's who among American high school teachers for four or five consecutive years. So that, that is my work as an educator. Everybody in your listening audience, you hear all the negative things about Chicago. You hear the shootings, the killings, the this, the that. We hear about this and we think like there's nobody in Chicago doing anything to work with young people. And that's just not true because this has been my life work, has been working with young people. And the thing that keeps me motivated is the love that I have for our people. That is the motivating factor behind everything that I do. That is what causes me to go above and beyond the call of duty in the schools. Now, brothers we talk, and sisters, we're talking about inner city schools in Chicago. Some of you don't want to deal with your own children. Your own children get on your nerves and you don't want to deal with them. When your children's friends come over, you don't want to deal with other people's children. But now you have a school system that has thousands of children and uh, I'm a brother because of the love that I have for them is I look forward to seeing them every single day and have been blessed to go in several school different environments and transform those environments for the better. So this is the work that I've done and my motivation is the love that I have for our children and our people. Thank you, Brother Abdul, for that. Let me ask you one more question and then I'll stop so that Brother Stephen can ask a few as well. If our listening audience has one, we'll take the listening audience first. But what was the comment you heard from a female student that changed the way you taught moving forward? So this is this is extremely powerful because you know sometimes we don't know what's in us until we're put in a situation and what's in us is brought out of us. And when it may have been my first year teaching in the public schools, but I had a student, I asked my students at the end of the year, I asked the student, I said, well, I asked the class, uh, what can I do to make what I'm doing to make this class better? And you know, the students gave their feedback to asking what they like, what I could improve. And this one sister said, this young sister, she said, I wish I learned more about black history. Man. Now, brothers and sisters, when I heard that, my heart was broken because I have I'm a black teacher teaching black children on the at that time, the west side of Chicago, an inner city school. And I have a young student in front of me that said that she wished she learned more about black history. And I know black history. I'm a member of the Nation of Islam. So I have a knowledge of black history. But what that one comment did, it changed something inside of me and revolutionized the way I educated black children. And I made a commitment to myself. I said, what I'm going to do next year, because I'm never going to have a student. I'm never for the rest of my teaching career, going to have a student tell me, Abdul Muhammad, that they wish they learned more about black history. It's never gonna happen again. Mm. So I made a commitment to myself. I said that I'm gonna give my students a black history fact every day at the beginning of class for mm. the whole school year. Now that's a heck of a commitment, but uh, brothers and sisters, I made that commitment. I fulfilled that commitment. Now, let me show you how God, how a lot of God works. Mm -hmm. When I started to give my students, black children, who they say they can't, you can't do nothing with them, lock them up and throw away the key. They're savages, they're animals, they're this, they're that. All of these lies and all of these things that they say is all, they don't want to learn, all false, mm -hmm. all untrue. I've been teaching them for almost 30 years and I'm telling you they want to learn just as much or more than anybody else. Right. But when I started to give them the black history fact, the eyes of the black children became open. Mm. And now I had children coming to school wanting to learn. Why? Because I was giving them a, uh, a root in their knowledge of self. I was giving them a root in themselves, the greatest knowledge we're taught is the knowledge of self and the knowledge of God. And those two are one and the same. So when I started to share with the children the knowledge of the great accomplishments of black people that's not in the textbooks. Now you have these white liberals who will tell you 
that they're all about teaching uh, critical race theory. I'm gonna tell y'all, I mean, you know, it, as Muslims, we get sometimes caught up in these debates. Please mm. don't fall for the okie doke because right. every year that I was teaching black children, it was the white liberals that were opposed to me teaching black children their own history. Hmm. So don't fall for the lie that they're in these schools teaching your children critical race theory or anything else. The problem with the school system is they're not teaching the children at all. Hmm. They're not teaching them critical race theory. They're not teaching them anything. <laughs> so when your children come home and say, you ask them, well, what'd you learn today? Man, oh, mama, I ain't learned nothing. You think they just, they're not lying to you. They telling you the 100% truth. Mm. So brothers and sisters, when I started to give the children the knowledge of who they were, the knowledge of the great accomplishments of black people, this opened the eyes and the hearts and the minds of the children. And they told me, Mr. Muhammad, the only reason I'm coming to school is to come to your class. Mr. Muhammad, when your class is over, I'm leaving because they weren't learning anything in those other classes. Mm. And the same white liberals who fake like they're our friends at every school where I gave the children what they wanted and what they needed, they worked against me and the civilizing work that I was doing among these children. So don't fall for the okie doke that somehow these white teachers want to give our children the knowledge of who they are. That's a lie. And I've been living it for the mm. last 25 years. And I'm letting you know it's a lie right now. Yes, sir. Uh, Let's go you, to bro. this uh, clip where you were on a news program and a student was on there with you uh, about the award that you have won. Yes, sir. Very much, Susan. This morning, we're taking you to the Academy Awards for teachers. Tonight, Westinghouse Career Academy High School, Abdul Mohammed is up for the highest honor, best teacher. Hmm. And student Darlisha Miles nominated him, and they both join us this morning. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Congratulations on being nominated. Thank and Darlisha, thank you very much for joining us this thank morning. You. Let me start off with you, Darlisha. Why did you pick this wonderful teacher to be uh, nominated for this wonderful award? Well, I picked Mr. Muhammad for this award because he's a great teacher. Um, students learn black history facts every day, all type of things, queens of Africa, all type of things, port, we go be gone, everything that we do. And Mr. Muhammad makes sure that his students learn and he goes beyond by creating activities that get us interested into wanting to do things, making school fun and just motivate us. That's awesome. Now, let me ask you this, Abdul. I mean, Listening to her, I'm getting chills because, you know, when you see a student motivated and, and excited about learning the way she is, yeah. and you're an educator, so that just must make you feel incredible. Tell me about that. Yes, well, it is an incredible feeling because, um, you know, every year when I start the school year at Westinghouse, of course, the students, they come in and they look at me funny. Um, but by the end of the year, the students, they enjoy my class. They love my class. They, I can't even Why teach. Why do they look at you funny? Because, because you got the bow tie? well, the bow ties <laughs> part. I wear a suit every day, so oh, you know, right, they're right, like, right. well, what is this, you know? And by the end of this year, I'll have students coming back to visit me from years before, so I can hardly even teach my class for the students coming by my room to see how I'm doing. And I just bring excitement. I you know, try to bring creative activities for the students to enjoy. Now, I understand you put a film together for Black History Month yes, this year, sir. right? Tell yes, me a little sir. bit about that. Well, every year there are students in the school who rap and um, make up their own songs. So I said, well, why don't you all make a song for Black History Month? So I took them to the studio. We recorded the song, and we did a music video for the song and we then we showed the video to the students at Westinghouse and they enjoyed it. We did that for two consecutive years. So now we have um, three songs that we've done total for Black History Month and two music videos that we've done. The Suave Performance Plus Award is the only award program in which students from the city's 93 public high schools nominate, judge, and select the award winner. Students at Westinghouse High School say Mr. Muhammad got the recognition he deserves. He like make learning fun, because usually I don't do good in world studies, but he make me look forward to coming to class. Because he is a good teacher. He makes sure the uh, students learn, and he like teach us about our heritage and all that, you know, all the good stuff. Powerful. Yes, sir. Powerful, yes, sir. brother. Yes, sir. So I, I wanted to kick off the question, uh, and then we have one in our chat as well, and that is, you know, hear, hearing, you know, what we just heard, I mean, there's no doubt in anyone's mind from the point that we began the program till now that you're an, not just an exceptional uh, principal and teacher, but that you have, as you were saying, a love and a passion for our children. 
that being said, why do you believe that they have come after you? Uh, brother, uh, so it's two parts. Any black educator that is successful in teaching black children, you're going to have a target on your back because the system that is currently in place does not want black children to be successful. Mm -hmm. So whether you're Abdul Muhammad or somebody else, if you're giving black children what they need to be in successful in a system that wants black children to fail, then you're going to have a target on your back. I'm not the first black educator that has been targeted by Chicago public schools or any public school system for having success with black children. I'm not the first. But now the thing, so that's one. The other thing that the uh, the reason that they came against me is, of course, because my name is Abdul Muhammad. I'm a student uh, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm a member of the Nation of Islam. And I'm never going to hide the fact that I'm in the Nation of Islam. Uh, you have other people who are coming out as whatever their sexual orientation is. You have people right. that want to use whatever pronoun they want to use. You have people that want to identify as this, that, and the third. And when those people come out and be who they say that they are, right. then the whole world has to bow down to who they say that they are. So then if that's the case, if we have to bow down and respect those people for what they say they are, then why would I hide the fact that I'm at Abdul Muhammad and I'm being not what I think I am, but what right. God made me, which is a righteous Muslim. Why would I hide that? So I'm never going to hide the fact that I'm Abdul Muhammad. I'm never going to hide the fact that I am a member of the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam saved my life and the lives of millions of black people, saved my brother's lives. Why would I hide the fact that I'm a member of the Nation of Islam that has done the greatest transformative work among black people in America than anyone else. Why would I hide that? And why would a arrogant white person want me to hide that? I'm not. So the, uh, the opposition and the reason that it was so intense uh, when I got to Limbloom is because uh, Limbloom is the uh, eight is ranked number eight in the city. And it's ranked number 22 in the state as far as schools. As long as I was at some little school, you know, that that Chicago public schools didn't care about, they tolerated me. Mm. They tolerated me. Now, I'm not saying they wanted me, but they tolerated right. me. But as soon as Allah blessed me to get to Limbaloon, which is ranked number eight in the city and number 22 in the state, then everybody, when I say everybody, I'm talking about the Chicago public school officials, all of them united as a Confederate force with seven white teachers to have me removed from the school. But the root of my removal is not because I did anything wrong, because they know I didn't do anything wrong. I just got to the school. I hadn't been at Limbloom for five or six years. I just walked in the door. And as soon as I walked in the door, they started their investigation. The, the day I walked in, they mm. started investigating me. So what are we talking about? I wasn't there long enough to do all these things that these seven white teachers who lied are claiming that I did. The root of it, and I'm, I'm saying it, but we have the evidence to back it up. I'm not just saying it without proof. Mm -hmm. We have the evidence to prove it. But the root of their opposition to me is because I'm a member of the Nation of Islam under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. That's that's just that's straight up. Anyone so, else? In the uh, Go ahead. I know please. that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw this on the flyer, and on the flyer it was uh, something to the effect: uh, "As a Muslim, my walk with Jesus as a Muslim." Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, so then Jesus says. See, everybody claims Jesus, but don't nobody want to walk with Jesus. Right. Oh, because you can claim him today. And, and if, if I say I love Jesus, ain't nobody saying nothing about that. Hmm. But if I say I love Farrakhan. Right. Then everybody got something to say. If I had a picture right now with me 
and um the white Jesus and the white Jesus, or I do you one better. If I had a picture with me and Jeffrey Epstein, if I'm hugged up with <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein, nobody thought oh, he took a picture with Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein. I'm not I'm not losing anything because of that. Right. But if you take a picture with the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. then you have to repudiate everything or you will lose everything that you worked your whole life for, for a photograph. Come on, bro. You don't, that type of opposition, I could take a picture with the bishop, Don Juan. Right. I could take a picture with Jeffrey Dahmer. I could take a picture with anybody. And I'm not losing my job, losing my livelihood, losing my status. I'm not losing anything. If I took a picture with white Jesus. Mm. But if you say, that you're with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. If you say that, then be prepared to be opposed by those who rule this world. The That's question right. is why. Right. Let's be That's critical right. thinkers. Yes, sir. The question is why. It is because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the Jesus that we've been looking for. And this is why if you stand with him, just like if you stood with Jesus, then you would be opposed by those who are in power like Jesus was opposed. So it's clear that the Muslims who follow the Honorable Louis Farrakhan are walking with Jesus. All we got to do is pick up our cross. All of us have a cross to bear. Yes. If you follow the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Listen to what the Bible says in the fifth chapter of Matthew. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you, shall lie on you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely right for my name's sake ain't nobody speaking evil if you rolling with white jesus if i have a white jesus chain and i'm on the block with the guys and i kiss it before i shoot up the button mm -hmm, white jesus i love you nobody cares about that that's right that's right nobody cares but if i go on that same block with the life-saving message of the that's animal right. archive, you have a problem with that okay, wait let me problem. prove it to you mm-hmm when right here in Chicago, in Los Peace, Angeles, brother. in New York, when the members of the Nation of Islam went into the projects mm. where there was murder, where Come there on. was death, where there was drugs, where there was rape, where there was abuse, where there was violence, where there was hatred. When those brothers went in the projects, we cleaned the projects up. That's right. right. And the housing projects all across America became peaceful what did we do we did the work of jesus right now if if we if our uh, opposition was sincere they not but if they were they mm -hmm. would say we do not agree with the politics or the philosophy of the minister and the nation but we respect the work that they have done Right in the projects and saving the lives of black people and transforming these projects, they would say we respect that and we want them to continue to do that work. Yes, sir. That's right. They didn't say that. Right. Why didn't they say that? Because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the Jesus of today. And when those miracles come on were performed in the projects all around America. The, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's enemies did what? They didn't celebrate his great work. They right. attacked his work and, and worked night and day to remove the brothers from the projects. And when we were finally removed, then what happened? The drugs came back. The crime right. came back. The abuse came back. The murder came back. The mayhem came back. So these people who oppose the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, they oppose black people because he's here to transform our lives for the better and help us. But that is the root of the opposition. That's the reason why they were so opposed to me uh, being at this selective enrollment school, even though it's 75% black, 95% uh, of the teachers are white. And you walk in there like I walked in and I'm thinking I'm on a plantation because all the teachers are white, but the janitors and the security guards are all black. Like, what are we talking about? This is, this is 2024. And I'm walking in the door and it's a plantation. That's insane. But that's what we're dealing with. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
Uh, so, what was your experience like during the principal selection committee process? What was that like? It was a beautiful experience. I need everybody to understand when, as the principal of Limbloom, I was voted in. So, you know, I don't want anybody to think, well, man, you know, Brother Abdul is trying to force himself into a place where he's not wanted. That's absolutely not true. The black LSC, the parents, the community people who select, that's their job. Their, their only job is to approve the budget and select the principal. And they formed a committee and they, in that committee, they looked at 11 different candidates. Uh, and from those 11 candidates, they narrowed it down to two, myself and another sister who's a friend of mine. And, you know, again, I've been in Chicago public schools for 25 years. So I already knew that they were opposed to me. When I say they, not the selection committee, but the people, the officials in downtown Chicago, because they worked against me for over seven years uh, uh, since I've been in administration in the city of Chicago. So it's not the first time. This is the first time I decided to fight back. But this is not the first time that they opposed me because I'm a Muslim in the nation of Islam. Mm. So when they had their 11 candidates and they went down to two and I was the finalist with another sister. They had what is called a principal forum and it was June 15th of 2022. And it was in a forum is like a public meeting. Mm -hmm. And at the public meeting, the candidates come out and they answer questions from the teachers, from the parents, from the community, whoever has questions. And then the local school council, the LSC goes back in closed session, makes their decision and comes out and announces it to the public. When I got to the principal forum on June 15th of 2022, they informed me that the other candidate dropped out because she was, she got another job offer and she went and took the other job offer. So now things had changed because now I'm not in the race with another candidate. I, there is no other candidate. And they went ahead with the form. We went ahead with the two hour form. I answered every question in the form. And when they got to the end of the form, now this is all on video. Like I'm not making this up. The video was on Lynn Bloom's website. Mm. When they got to the end of the forum, the local school council never came back out and made a public announcement that which is done in every principal forum. Right. Since they've had local school councils, this is the only one that I know of where the announcement of who they selected was not made. So they never made an announcement that night. In fact, the moderator, Ms. Wheatley, came to me and said, well, something is going on. We'll give you a call. I knew exactly what was going on. Once CPS realized that I was the sole candidate, and I'm now I knew it then, but we have the evidence now. But I knew it then. Once CPS found out that Abdul Muhammad was the only candidate, oh. the CPS, the Chicago Public School officials, Devon LaRosa, um, Kinshasa Williams Ford, and others, they lost their mind and they started to call the local school council officials and tell them to restart the process. You got to get new candidates. We don't want Abdul Muhammad. We want other candidates. We want to be able to make a choice. So they have been doing this already, looking for a principal for over a year. So they've been looking for a principal for over a year. They get 11 candidates, go down to two, now down to one. And now because it's Abdul Muhammad, and he's the sole candidate, so you can't even play games and say, well, just choose the other one. He's the only candidate and the LSC voted me in. And when they voted me in, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. And that was June 15th. I didn't walk into Limbloom until July 5th was my first day there. Because from June 15th to July 5th, the Chicago public school officials were working to try to convince the LSC not to select me as the principal to start the process over again. So the thing that turned the tide is that on July 1st, the principal's uh, union president named Troy LaRavier wrote a letter on July 1st and put everybody in Chicago public schools on the letter and put them on blast and asked two questions. In his letter, he said, are you discriminating against this man because of his religion, because he's a Muslim, or are you discriminating against this man because he's black? Lynn Bloom has never had a Muslim principal before. Uh, and never had a black male principal before since the school reopened in 2005. Once that brother wrote that letter and put everybody in CPS on blast, that is when they relented. That was July 1st. They relented. And on July 5th, 
15th, pardon me, July 5th, that was my first day uh, at the school, but they were opposed to me being there. They tried to stop it before I walked in the door. Since the LSC stood strong, the local school council stood strong. Once I got there, then what they did is they worked to undermine my leadership every day while I was there so they could come up with this fake investigation and remove me from the school. So everything that happened was contrived and their whole purpose was to get me out. So we have a question uh, that's in the chat and I'll go ahead and put it up uh, from Brother Timothy. He actually has two great questions. I'll put the first one up. It says, during the great trial, Allah has put you put you and your family under. What are some of the principles of the teachings of the most honorable of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad have aided you thus far? I will tell uh, that's a that's an absolutely great question. I need you all to understand that as a uh, teacher and as a assistant principal and principal in Chicago public schools, I live my life by the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's just how I live my life. I try to implement what we're taught. If you talk to white people who I work with, I've worked with white people for years. If you talk to them, if they're honest, uh, they will tell you that Mr. Muhammad has always treated them with freedom, justice, and equality, because that's what we're taught. They want to say that, oh, well, you know, the members of the Nation of Islam are haters. They're a hate group. But now, this is my question to you. If we were haters, then in my 25 years, you would be able to provide some example. I've been working with white people, age. I work with everybody. Mm-hmm. Bring evidence. Right. Bring evidence that I've ever showed any hatred towards anybody because of their sexuality, because of their race, because of their gender, because of their religion. You have no evidence, but we have evidence of you because I'm a Muslim, because I'm a black man, because you don't agree with my religion. And because you don't agree, we have evidence of your hatred for us but you don't have no evidence for our so-called hatred of you. So, but to go back to the question, I live my life based on the teachings. So every, every principle that we're taught, for example, like I don't gossip, you know, now I'm talking to the teachers, you know, that when you go in the teacher's lounge, (laughs) you know, what's happened in the teacher's lounge, not Abdul Muhammad. I don't gossip. I don't do none of that. Um, so I live my life based on the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm not going to apologize for that. I always tell the truth. I respect those in authority as we're taught, right? We're taught to respect those in authority, whether they respect you or not, and to do what they say as long as it does not conflict with your religion. So yes, I'm not, if, I, if I disagree with my principal or somebody in authority over me, Even my network chief who is working every single day to undermine me working with the seven white teachers. If you ask him, did this man ever disrespect your authority while you was his network? He will tell you no, not because of him. I don't I don't care about him, but it's the principle of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that we're following. When the when the teacher at Limbloom was putting money in her personal bank account, it was three of them. Mm-hmm. Now, when I found out, I didn't go and put them on. Black, uh, I didn't send an email to the whole staff, which is what they would do. If right. they thought I did something wrong, then the white teachers would send an email to everybody in the whole school to try to put me on blast. Mm-hmm. But when I found them wrong and they were wrong on a lot of different things. Right. Did I put them on blast? No, I followed the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I, what did he say? He said, Wh- whoever you have a problem with or issue with, speak to them directly. And that's exactly what I did. Mm-hmm. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you this. I would not have made it as far as I made it and had the success that Allah has blessed me to have if I did not follow the principles of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. You can't find a student 
the students when i was at chicago vocational it's a true story i would teach my students a black history fact and when my students would leave my class they would be so excited about what they <laughs> learned we're talking about black children on the south side of chicago beautiful right they so excited that they would go into the next teacher's class talking about what they learned in my class <laughs> so some of these white teachers became envious of the love that the children had for mr muhammad so right. rather than teach their class i'm not making this up rather than teach their class they would get my students notebook where they would have the black history fact written down and they would be looking at what i'm teaching in my class instead of teaching their class now one right. day and the students would come to me right the students would come to me and they would say mr muhammad so-and-so told you this so-and-so another teacher said this about you so-and-so said that about you i never paid any attention to it never i never told the student anything negative about their white teachers as the white teachers were doing me never one day a young brother his name was um jeremy jeremy came to my class and said mr muhammad uh, so-and-so said that what you teaching is a bunch of BS mm. and I was hot. It just was one of them days. I didn't tell Jeremy, I'm going to go beat it. I, I didn't do that. I, what did I do? I did what we're taught. What are we taught? The honorable minister Louis Farrakhan said this. He said, the quickest way to manifest the contradiction is to bring all the parties together. Mm. So, I mean, like we do this, he say, she say, and I, eh, bring everybody together. Right. And have one conversation works wonders. To minimize confusion so what did i do when that class ended i didn't say nothing to jeremy when that class ended i took jeremy to the teacher's classroom and i knocked on the teacher's door and i asked him to step outside in a respectful manner and i said to him to his face i said jeremy said that you said that what i'm teaching is a bunch of bs and the teacher lied oh i, I didn't say that i didn't say that and then I turned to Jeremy. I said, you said that he said that what I'm right. teaching is a bunch of BS. And Jeremy looked at the white teacher. Man, you did say that. You did say that. So then the teacher admitted it. So then I went in, not on Jeremy. I went in on the teacher in front of Jeremy. You understand? But I'm right. not doing, I'm not going, I'm not talking to no children, which is what they do. But we're the haters. No, I'm not talking to no children. I went directly to the teacher. So when I confronted the teacher about his foolishness, then the teacher went to the assistant principal and wrote a long three page letter. Either Mr. Muhammad goes or I go. So he ended up leaving, but it is what it is. Truth right. and falsehood cannot exist in the same place at the same time. So I'm only saying this brothers and sisters in all of my years of working with our people, working with white people, working with every race and every ethnic group and every sexuality. I followed the principles of the teachings and treated everybody with freedom, justice, and equality. And if you ask people who know me, that's what they're going to tell you. And that's just what it is. But that's that's what we're taught. So um, I have two questions. You know, when you, and one is, man, I mean, I want to cover so much, but one is when you, when you first started in Loom Bloom, right? Uh, we have summer vacation going on, but you walked in and you saw, I think it was 13 employees working and it was summer school. Yeah, it was actually, do you think, right? Yeah. So, so do you think that that's part of the beginning that they recognized Brother, yeah, that change uh, was coming? Yeah, I didn't even understand. Thank, that's a great question. So, I didn't even understand the impact of what I was doing until I reflected on it. Mm. My first day at Limbloom was July 7th. My first day at Limbloom was July 7th of 2022. And when I walked into Limbloom, I don't know anybody there. My network chief who was trying to undermine me from the very beginning, his name is Devon LaRosa. He was there the same day that I got there, my first day on um, July 5th, I believe it was. When I got there, the there were 15 people working 
and there were no students in the building because the building was under construction. Mm -hmm. So now for any principal, right, that's a red flag because we're taught that if there's no students, right, then ain't nobody getting paid. And there's zero students. You got 15 people working, right? So on my first day, I sent the email and I asked the question, you know, who are all these people and what are they doing here? I'm trying to understand, like, what's going on? That's the first day. Now, I didn't mm -hmm. realize they know what's going on. They riding the clock, getting paid and not doing no work. They know exactly what's going on. I don't know what's going on. My network chief who tried to undermine me for a year, he knew what was going on and didn't do anything about it. So this is a problem that I inherited. So I asked the question, what are these people doing here? Because for me, that raised a red flag, right? Mm -hmm. So then that's my first day. My second day, July 8th. My first day was July 7th. My second day was July 8th. Right. My second day there, I meet with the assistant principal. Her name is Fitzpatrick. And I asked her, I said, are there teachers working over the summer? She said, yes. I said, well, because, uh, you know, pe teachers work over the summer. They do curriculum, different things like that. But now mm -hmm. the issue is you can't pay them if you don't have any evidence that they've actually done some work. Because anybody can say they're working over the summer. They could be on vacation somewhere. So you can't pay them. If you say, well, we need a curriculum map, we need 10 lesson plans, we need this, this, and this, then once we get this, then we'll pay you for the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. So this is my second day. I said, okay, if they're working, then have them to put all of their work in a folder, a Google folder, so we can justify paying them. They never put any work in the folder. What am I telling you, brothers and sisters? Mm. I walked into a situation where it was already corrupt when I walked in the door. You already had 15 people working and no students in the building. You already had teachers working, but not producing any evidence for their work. And all I did was my job. But because they were so used to being corrupt, then that was the beginning, as you said, of them knowing that they could not continue down that same path that. Uh, I'm not going to rubber stamp everything that they say and everything that they do. Mm. And so right. you know how it is, brothers and sisters. White people don't want nobody black holding them accountable. That's just a fact. They don't respect black people in authority unless you're a black person in authority that allows them to do what they want to do. But as soon as you hold white people accountable, then they're going to work against you. That's just what that is. You all know that because some of you have lived that yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. We have a, uh, another question. Oh, sure, go right, right ahead, brother. Okay. okay. Let, let the guest ask. I'll save mine till last. It's, a, it's, a, it's somewhat personal but inspirational. I want to ask him about the black history facts <laughs> that he taught in his class. Uh, at the beginning of the class, how long, how much time did you spend on that black fact? Expound on that a little bit more, but take these questions first. Save okay. mine for last. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It says, from your perspective, is the fall of the current educational system a sign of the war of Armageddon have begun? If so, please explain. Well, Brother Timothy, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, because when you look at the uh, war of Armageddon, it's really a war of truth against falsehood. Mm. And what are you looking at when you look at the educational system? You have school systems and districts right now that don't want the truth of what happened to black people to be taught in those schools. That's right. You know, so so and I and I'm not really talking the critical race theory thing, but you have school districts right now that if you teach about what white people have done to black people in history in a historical context, they want to ban them from learning that. Mm. Then you have the white liberal, right? Who will say no we want to teach this but they really don't want to teach it because when you walk into schools they're not teaching anything right so and and neither one of these are good right. if we teach black children and white children and asian children about what happened to black people that's not uh an indictment on a white child because uh, this happened and it was lynching or slavery or whatever the case may be. 
So see, whenever you hide the truth, then you break the uh, relationship because there can be no relationship unless that relationship is structured on truth. That's so there right. can't be uh, any uh, a black and white relationship, race relationship, if it's structured on lies and falsehood. But that is what the so-called conservatives want, right? They want it not to be taught, but that's also, believe it or not, what the white liberals want. Because they don't want it to be taught either, right? Right. So, and, and I can, and I've lived it for 25 years. It's not white conservatives that's those, the seven white teachers at Limbaloon were not white conservatives and Trump supporters. They were so called white liberals who were mad at the fact that Abdul Muhammad was the principal at Limbaloon and was holding them accountable for what they were not doing for black children. So, when, if the war of Armageddon is a war between truth and falsehood, and we can't teach the truth or they don't want truth taught in schools, then you're looking at the war of Armageddon because really it's for the minds of the people. That's the real war. The war is for the minds of the people. So uh, I pray that I answered your question. Yes, sir. So from the uh, medium, uh, a, a internet newspaper written by Brian Jordan, he said, according to CPS, C CPS's own record, six out of nine principals removed in the past four years pending investigation were black, a demographic right. already underrepresented among principals. Three right. of those principals, including yourself, have been removed from their positions this year under questionable circumstances. So the question is, is what is your insight into the demotion of six black principals by the Board of Education. Well, brother, you know, the black educator has always been under attack in Chicago as well as around the country. And what we found mm -hmm. out, uh, I haven't read that article, but I know that Sarah Carp, who is a journalist in Chicago who writes for WBEZ as well as the Sun Times, she used the Freedom of Information Act to get uh, discipline records from Chicago public schools on the removal of principals and uh, as, as well as their racial demographic, right? And what Sarah Karp found out is that in one year, 10 principals were removed. And out of those 10, uh, seven of them were black men and there was one black woman. So eight out of 10 of the principals removed were black and seven of the 10 were black men. Now, I need your listeners to understand black men only make up 8% of the Chicago public school principals. 8% of Chicago public school principals are black men, but we're 70% of the removal. So what Sarah Karp proved in her article is that Chicago public schools, the same district that says, oh, we believe that black children need to have black leaders in front of them. We believe that black children need to have black teachers and we believe in equity and we believe in anti-racism. The same district that says this out of their mouth is practicing what they've always practiced which is racism and inequity because they're targeting black principles for removal. So if you do something wrong and you get removed, that's one thing, right? But if I target you, if I say, look, I need you seven white teachers to come up with whatever you can against this man so that we can remove, so we can justify removing him that is targeting that person. That is not them doing something wrong and then being investigated for wrongdoing. So Chicago Public Schools targets black leadership, specifically black male leadership. Now, brothers, you already know. If I was Abdul Muhammad and I put on a dress and wore some lipstick, man. And wow, man, that's not, I'm hold on, I'm gonna pass up. Go <laughs> if I walked in the door. Right. As Abdul Muhammad with lip gloss and a dress on the first LGBT Muslim principal, you would hear it all over the world. Right. Absolutely. I would be celebrated, honored and made the principal of the year. Mm -hmm. But when you're a strong black man, whether you have Abdul Muhammad or not, you're just a strong black man. Right. For sure. Then the forces of white supremacy are going to oppose you. You are a strong black man and you advocating for black children. You're going to be opposed by the forces of white supremacy. 
So, and, and that's what we're looking at um, in Chicago. And that's what we're looking at around the country. So can you, can you give us some insight, a little bit of insight into what's, you know, we, we have some names, Miss McDonald, uh, uh, Kel, uh, Miss Kelly uh, Tag, Tarrant, right. Tagrant. Tarrant. Can you tell us what, what 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 is that going on there because i think like you're saying you expose you know workers who were working over summer vacation mm -hmm. break but then you expose uh where money was right. actually siphoned from right. the students can you talk a little bit yeah. about that and how this whole ball started really rolling absolutely so i want to just do a real quick public service announcement so brothers and sisters i've been fighting this fight for months now and what I would like you all to do, I definitely, as you can see, we have the cover of the final call is, is dealing with this particular situation. But I want you all to, to visit the website, justiceforabdulmohammed.com, justiceforabdulmohammed.com, and share with your friends and family. I want you to sign the petition. There's a petition on the website that we want you to sign. There's also a GoFundMe on the website. If you would like to make a donation, you can do that on the GoFundMe. The third thing you can do on that website is you can send a letter to Mayor Brandon Johnson. You don't have to come up with the letter. All you have to do is click on his name right on the website, justiceforabdulmohammed.com. If you click on his name, the letter is going to automatically populate and all you have to do is click send. Mayor Brandon Johnson has the, because he's over the schools as the mayor, he has the ability to change this tomorrow if he wanted to, but he has not uh, decided to address this for whatever reason but he does have that ability. So we want you all to go on that website, uh, justiceforabdulmohammed.com and uh, do those three things, sign the petition, uh, make a donation and send a letter to uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson. Brother, can you repeat that question for me real quick? I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. And I was talking about um, some of the players that yeah, are in the I, game. I can give you some of the players. Um, yeah. So there was one, the, so when I got to Limbloom, Many things were being done improperly. And uh, one of those things was the finances of the school. My first day at Limbloom was July 7th of 2022. On July 13th of 2022, it's just a few days after I walked in the door, I requested that the CPS, uh, Chicago Public Schools Finance Department, do an audit. Because again, brothers and sisters who are listening, I knew that they were trying to do everything they could to undermine my leadership and that they were going to try to fabricate something or come up with something that they could justify mm. my removal. I knew this walking in the door because of the opposition before I even got there. Right. So I didn't want to inherit any financial irregularities from the previous administration. And it's always best practice when you're the new principal to request the audit. So I, my first day was July 7th, July 13th is the day that I requested the audit. Uh, while we're waiting for the audit, uh, I noticed that I went to a football game. It was the homecoming football game. And Limbloom is a, like a huge school with a with a with a, a, a very active alumni. So we have hundreds of people at the homecoming game. Mm. While when I'm at the homecoming game, I hired a brother who was a retired athletic director, because whenever you get in a leadership position, you need people around you that are going to be honest with you and they're going to have your back. And this brother had my back uh so as a retired athletic director he asked me the question he said uh brother muhammad did you get the financial report from the football game mm. i said financial report now this is the homecoming <clears throat> game i said no so uh i emailed the clerk laconda mcdaniel right that's the person who you brought up laconda mcdaniel was the clerk or is still the clerk at limbloom right so i emailed the clerk and i asked her for the financial report from the football game the uh when i got the uh well i didn't get the financial report mm -hmm. uh, well at first i didn't get it and then what laconda mcdaniel and um the athletic director her name is christina davis they just made up a report because they weren't keeping any records now again i'm walking into a school where they're having sports activities and the people who are supposed to keep the records, the clerk and the athletic director, mm -hmm. are not keeping any records. So they just made something up. But when I looked at the amount, and I said, no, it was way more people in the stands than this. What I'm looking at doesn't match the number of people that was in the stands. 
Mm. But now, I, since they weren't keeping records, I didn't have any evidence. So I couldn't say that there was something going on, right? Mm. So then it hit me. This is the fifth game of the season. <laughs> there were four more games prior to this one. I didn't get a financial report for any of the football games. So I wasn't going to go back to them so they could lie to me again. So I went to the, the CPS stadium director and I asked him for the records from the stadium because the stadium keeps a record of how many tickets sold. So I finally get the records from the stadium director. So now I have evidence that tickets were sold, money was collected, and nothing was turned in. Mm. So I didn't go gossip. I didn't put them on an email to all the staff. I didn't do that. I went to them directly. I had a meeting with Miss Davis and Miss McDaniel in my office. And I asked them, I looked them dead in their face. I said, mm. where's the money from the previous football games? Mm -hmm. They both looked at me and said, there is no money. Mm. So then, you know, we have actual facts. I, I had three copies of the stadium record. I gave right. each one of them a copy and I had my copy. Mm. And then I looked at them again and said, where's the money from the previous football game? Miss McDaniel didn't say anything because she knew mm. she was busted. Christina Davis said, oh, that's my money. I said, that's your money. She said, yeah, I brought money to make change. So that's my money. I said, Miss Davis, it doesn't work like that. If you right. sell one ticket for $5, then the $5 got to be turned into the school. This lady left my office saying that that was her money. Huh. She emailed me on Saturday and said, I realized the mistake I made. I have the money for you on Monday. So now what was happening is the athletic director and the clerk were working they weren't turning no money in the money was in miss davis bank account now she wasn't the only one she was the first one then i mm. found two now now I, I have to understand we're talking about white teachers in a black neighborhood with thousands of black people's dollars in their personal bank accounts everybody who had money in their bank accounts who was covering up student injuries who was riding the clock, who were getting paid for no work, they all still work for Chicago Public Schools right now. The Chicago Public School officials wanted me out so bad that they violated their own policies just to get me out of the school. So that's how uh, eager they were, as the brothers and sisters in the street would say, that's how thirsty they were mm. uh, to get Muhammad out. So Ms. Davis had all this money in her bank account, uh, and, you know, and I'm, I'm giving you all a quick version. There's a lot more details to it. All right. right. But again, you had another instance of a black uh, principal holding white teachers accountable for what they were doing with black people's money. And when the black principal came in holding white teachers accountable for black people's money, the white people got upset. And Christina Davis was used by the law department to lie. She's one of the, as you put it on the screen, she's one of the people that the law department used to lie against me. And Miss mm -hmm. McDaniel was used by the law department to lie mm -hmm. against me. Both of them are in the law department report. Uh, my immediate supervisor, his name is Devon LaRosa. He was one of the liars as well because he knows the truth. But he won't open his mouth and speak the truth that he knows. Uh, mm -hmm. the person who, now all of these people, the seven white teachers, um, they were the ones that, uh, lied to the law department. Kelly Tarrant, who is the lawyer, oh, she's not a lawyer, but she's the investigator over the law department. Uh, they're the, she's the one that the white teachers came to with their lies. And this woman co-signed every lie that the mm -hmm. white teachers told did not fact check a single lie except that everything they said is truth the only person they fact checked in the entire investigative process was me and i'll give you a few examples one of the white teachers his name is ian brannigan mm. ian brannigan told the law department that on december 22nd i came to work late december 22nd of 2022 was the first major snowstorm of 2022 so Ian Brannigan lied to the law department because they were trying to paint this false picture that I was uh, didn't care about the school. So Ian Brannigan lies to the law department and says, 
Oh, yeah. On the day of the snowstorm, Mr. Muhammad came to work late and didn't do anything to help the school. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you would think like I'm, I'm going to ask you if you wanted to fact check that. If you're an investigator, how would you fact check whether or not the principal came to work late? Anybody can answer your your viewers, anybody. If you wanted to fact check what he said, how would you do that? Right. You well, check the clock. Did. You check the clock. Check the time clock. Mm -hmm. Kelly Tarrant, the white investigator for the law department, she didn't, she didn't do, she didn't check Ian Brannigan to see if he was telling the truth. So I went in myself and I checked December 22nd. And I I saw on December 22nd, I swiped in at 746. Mr. Brannigan swiped in at 747. So these teachers were able to lie. The law department did not fact check anything that they said. For example, I'll give you another example. Miss McDaniel lied to the law department in, in, in Chicago public schools. They have a, what is called a vendor application. So anybody who wants to be a vendor has to complete the application. Miss McDaniel lied to the law department and said, it's her responsibility as the school clerk to complete the vendor application. When they asked me, I said, it's not the clerk's responsibility, it's the principal's responsibility. Now, we're talking about an investigative department. And I told them when they asked me, I said, well, all you have to do is call the Office of Procurement and ask them. Hmm. Do you think they actually picked up the phone and called the Office of Procurement and asked them, who approves, who, who sponsors vendor applications, the principal or the clerk? You think they did that? Mm. Absolutely not. They went back to Miss McDaniel and they asked Mix McDaniel. That's how insane right. this whole investigation was. Mm. So, and, and I could, brothers, I'm, listen, when, when I stand up and say that these teachers told over 83 lies, I'm not like, this is not my opinion. It's not, oh, I just, I just decided on the number 83 to sound good. No, I went through the report over 50 times, line by line, and have the evidence, the facts, to prove every word that's coming out of my mouth. Mm. So when I say they told 83 lies, I can sit down with anybody and prove to you that they lied, prove to you that they didn't fact check. Um, but so, so I'm confident that I'm innocent, right? They use these liars to frame and fabricate a case against your brother yes. and remove me from the school. We got a question from uh, the audience and I'll put it on screen. It says, uh, where do we stand now with the court date of the lawsuit? Have you any of those teachers or CPS law officials left CPS, if you know? So that's a great question. All of the people who stole money, who covered up, all of them are still working for CPS, every last one of them. And the reason is because if anything was to happen to them, the house of cards would collapse. So Ms. Davis stole money. She wasn't the only one. You had two other teachers uh, that were stealing money, had money in their personal bank accounts that I had to tell them, you got to put that money in the school's bank account. Ms. Davis, we had four cheerleaders that were injured. She was covering up student injuries and lied to the people in CPS and said that I knew about it when, when I didn't know about it. She had some illegal practice off-site from the school. So all of these people right now, Ms. McDaniel, who allowed the money to be stolen as a clerk, she still works for Chicago Public Schools. Everybody who lied still works for CPS. The only person CPS removed was me. Now they claim they're doing an investigation, but that's like the police investigating themselves. You already know where that's gonna go, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why we want people to blow this up. There's enough videos on justiceforabdulmuhammad.com because Chicago Public Schools do not, does not have a leg to stand on. Uh, they're liars. We have the evidence to prove that they're lying and we're going to expose their lies as we've exposed some of them uh, to the public. As far as a court case, we have filed our complaint with the EEOC and we're going through that process right now. But we definitely Beautiful. take them to court. So what do you think is the, is the significance of the support you have received from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Father Flager 
uh, attorney Ben Crump, uh, even Jesse Jackson. So what I'll say is that, you know, when principals are removed and from Chicago public schools, mm -hmm. what they usually do is they usually just go somewhere else and don't say anything. Right. I'm not the first. I'm not the first black principal. I'm not the first black male principal. I'm not the first person that's been railroaded. I know a lot of. I've been in this system for 25 years, so I know a lot of brothers and sisters, and they know that Chicago public schools is corrupt. And the people who are in Chicago public schools now, who I know, who are black and brown, they know that Chicago public schools is corrupt. But they never had a principal that would stand up and fight. So mm. when principals got removed, they just moved along and just, you know, ne never said anything. Right? right. And when these people came against me now, brothers, let me say this. If I actually had done something wrong, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to say, look, and y'all come defend me and I did something wrong. If they actually brought me, I'm a Muslim. Right. And as a Muslim, we believe that the greatest thing in the universe is truth itself. Mm -hmm. Come on. So as a Muslim, I'm not going to deny truth because to deny, no matter where it comes from, we're not like y'all. You only accept truth from the source that you want to accept truth from. We accept truth wherever truth comes from. There is a difference. So now if I actually was guilty and did something wrong, I wouldn't be on here talking to you all. I wouldn't be sitting down with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But I'm innocent and I can prove my innocence. So since right. I'm innocent, I have no other choice but to fight. You Dude. understand? The yes, other sir. principals just walked away and they didn't stand up and fight Chicago public schools. And I didn't, I, that was not my decision. That That's not what I decided to do. I stood up, I fought, and the Holy Quran teaches us that fighting is prescribed for you, even though it is disliked by you. Mm. That fighting is good for you. How is fighting good for you? Because fighting brings out what's within. You don't know who you really are. You, We all say that, man, you know, see, see, if it get cracking, you know, we, that's what we say. <laughs> right. We all say that, and I've seen it. Until it actually happens, mm. and then the fight manifest was really on the inside. Right. Which could be a hero or it could be a coward. But you don't know what you are, right? Right. Until the fight comes. So that's what it is, brothers and sisters. You know, uh, they lied and I couldn't lay down and just let it go. That's and right. so in that fight, Allah always blesses the fighters, right? Yes, sir. When they, the Holy Quran says that when they come at you in a headlong manner, Right. And Allah would send angels, havoc making angels, right? This is yes, the whole sir. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. I didn't, brothers and sisters, I am 100% innocent. I, all I did was walk in the door. That's all I did. And just yes, my sir. presence made these people lose their mind. Yes, and sir. they came at me in a headlong manner, and Allah is sending his angels around me to protect me, to help me, and to fight for me. So that's how I would answer that question. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, thing. And I'll say this, you know, because we're talking about uh, as a Muslim, my walk with Jesus as a Muslim. Right. And there's a song that we sing in church or that we used to sing. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. And I'm going to tell y'all straight up. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a friend of the black man and woman right from day one i'm talking about from day one of me being at Limbloom, the honorable minister lewis farrakhan has been there the honorable minister lewis farrakhan has given me guidance and direction from day one when they removed right. me on march 31st um on administrative leave i walk out of this building on april 11th and my phone rings, and it's the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on the phone. Huh. And he didn't ask me. He didn't say, brother, what did you do? He didn't say that. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan from the beginning knew that I was innocent. Beautiful. And this was Ramadan. This is April 
right? We're in the middle <coughs> of Ramadan, and in that conversation, I say, brother minister, my spirit is to fight. And he said, brother, that's the right spirit. He said, brother, are you familiar with those brothers in Tennessee that were removed from the state house? I said, yes, sir. He said, those, those brothers have the spirit of Joshua. They're not like the other Negroes in Tennessee. What he was telling right. me is that those other print you 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 have the spirit of Joshua. You like you not like those other principles. He said that the man kicked them out of the state house, but one is back, and the other one is on his way at that time. And he said, "My point to you, this now keep in mind, brothers and so this is April 11. Right. He said, "My point to you is that it backfired." He said, "Brother." this will backfire and that's exactly that's right because they didn't think that when they rolled on abdul muhammad that Allah was going to roll on them they had no idea that's right so now once i stood up other principles stood up and because the same thing happened to them so all praise is due to Allah. yes sir all praise is due to Allah. Uh, so if you want, I got uh, uh, one more question on my end, brother minister. If you have anything left, yeah. The, the, when we get back to that fact, what when you open up his class, they start with a black fact. I want to know right. what that black fact. Well, I'm not sure it was many, but how long, how much time did you spend at the front of your class on the black fact? So, brother minister Donnell, uh, it would depend on what the black history fact was okay some would be longer than others the first day the first black history fact the first day every year is i would deal with this word you know the favorite word in the black community which is the nigger word nigger and so on the first day of me doing the black history fact my first black history fact every year was what is a nigger right so you may say, well, why did you start with that? I'm starting where they are because I, every one of them thinks that's what they are, right? Right. So, but they don't know what the word means. So I teach them what the word means, right? Because in my class as a teacher, you can't, this is a word you can't use in my class, but you can make a whole bunch of rules and the students don't know why you have these rules, right? So if I say, well, you can't use this word, then they have to understand why I'm asking them not to use the word. But they also have to understand what that word really means. Yes, sir. So the first black history fact, because the again, what are we talking about? We're talking about the knowledge of self. Right. right. And they all walk in thinking that they the N word. Right. I'm the baddest N word in Chicago. I'm the baddest N word in this school. Right. Right. So we got to deal with that. So that's the first black history fact every year. And really, it just depends on the length of whatever the, the topic is. But what it what it does, Brother Donnell, it gives me an opportunity at the beginning of class to uh, give them a root in themselves. Now, yeah. even before I start the black history fact, because I don't do it on the actual first day of school, uh, but maybe shortly thereafter. Uh, but I would always give my students a test, right? A short little black history test. And I did it every year for 17 years. And every year, every student in every class failed the test. Mm. Let me say this again. For 17 years, I taught. Every year, every student in every class failed the test that I gave them. A short little black history test. Mm -hmm. Now you have to ask the question and, and like I'm telling you what I tell them after I give them the test and everybody in the class has failed. I ask them the question. I say, here you are in high school, you black. Right. And don't know anything about your history. Now, look, it ain't we didn't have one person pass over here. One person got a 70 percent over there. Somebody got an 80. Somebody got a 60. All we got is one legged A's flags on every test mm. then i asked them is it an accident or is it by design right how is it that every student in every class every year fails this simple black history test mm -hmm. it can't be an accident 
Right. If one right. or two fail, that's an accident. But if everybody fails, it's got to be by design. And so this is I duplicated. Have, they all right. 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 Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we're going to change that. Then the, the listen to what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said. He said, when you want to teach somebody, you start them where you want them to end up. I'm going to say it again. Mm -hmm. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that if you want to teach somebody, you start them, you begin at the end. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what I did. After I gave them the test and everybody failed, I gave them a little spill about how it's, a, it's, it's not an accident. Then I say, our brothers and sisters, by the time you finish with this class, you have, because uh, I taught a black history class, you have like a regular class, right? This is me teaching. You have an honors class, right? You have an AP, which is advanced placement class, right? And then way up here, you got Mr. Muhammad's class. Wow. Because what I'm going to give you, this is what I'm telling the children, what I'm yeah. going to give you is going to make you superior to all of them. When you go to the family reunion and you start to talk, your family is going to gather around to listen to what you got to say. So right. I'm telling them on the first day of school, I'm painting the picture for them of where the knowledge that I'm going to give them is going to take them in the future. Yes, sir. I don't care what school your brother, sister, I don't care what school you go to, you're going to be smarter than all of them. All you got to do is pay attention. Man, mm -hmm. brother, by the time I finish that, they all in. Right. And that's the first day of school. So, but to answer your question, my brother, it's different black history fact. There's different lengths, so it takes different amount of times. I, I do that at the beginning, then I go into the regular lesson. And I tell them, I said, look, I have a hard job because I have to give you what you absolutely need, right? Which is the knowledge of self. But I also have to give you what the state mandates that you need. So don't think, mm. oh. He's just in there giving black history facts, but he's not teaching them what the state. No, no, stop. Because in the time frame, we have time to do both. So I'm not right. sacrificing the curriculum to give them black history facts. I'm not doing that. I'm just supplementing what the curriculum says with the knowledge of self. Yes, sir. And so, you know, just to clarify that knowledge of self, that's so important, right? And so learning that black history fact what does that can you help us to understand why that's so significant and what that means for them to now begin to actually truly learn the process of learning so uh let me give it like this because uh, in a scientific way you know in every chemical experiment uh there's a catalyst right and the catalyst is the thing that causes the chemical reaction, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, all of us have done this experiment some some two or three times where we made the volcano, right? right. And you make your little volcano, right? And then you get the baking soda, right? You get the, the dishwashing liquid, right? You get the dye, right? And then you get the vinegar, right? So now if you put the baking soda in, right? And you put the dishwashing liquid in, right? And then you put the dye in. Is the volcano going to erupt? No, no. You get no eruption. You don't get a reaction. A chemical reaction does not happen until the catalyst is introduced. And the catalyst is what causes the chemical reaction, right? So it is the same way in education, right? When students come to learn, all of the, I mean, all, like science, all of that math, science, all of that is important, right? But what is going to make it all make sense to the child? What makes it all make sense is when you can tie the science to self, right? Mm. You can tie math to self. You can tie history to self. You can tie PE, all the subjects. Once you tie all the learning to the most important thing to anybody, right. right? Which is themselves. Now the student, see that's the knowledge of self is the catalyst that 
makes the student want to learn. What did the most honorable Elijah Muhammad say? Message to the black man. Knowledge of self makes us want to take on what? The great virtue of learning. Right. So, like, that's what I'm telling you. Our children out. Listen, the worst school in America, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I can go to the worst school in America and God will bless me to transform the worst school and make it the best. Because I yes, know exactly sir. what to do to make right. children want to learn and receive a quality education is rooted in giving them the knowledge of self. Yes, and sir. you did that at, at Nancy B. Uh, Nancy B. Yeah, I, I um, did that everywhere, brother. I did it at Westinghouse on the west side of Chicago. I did it at CBS on the south side, Chicago Vocational. I did it at Simeon, which is also on the south side. I did it at Julian, which is in an area in Chicago called the Wild Hunnets, right? Um, and then I did it at Nancy B. Jefferson, which is a school that's inside of the Cook County Detention Center. Right. And then when I left Nancy B. De Jefferson and went to Douglas in Austin that has the highest homicide rate in the city of Chicago, did the same thing there. So it's everywhere I've gone, God has blessed me to do a transformative work with our children. We got uh -huh. one, uh, a, a few more questions, uh, Brother Rodney, and then we'll begin to wrap it on up. Okay, uh, go yes, right ahead. Salam alaikum, brother. I, I really don't have a question. I want to thank you for what you're doing and let you know that we've been blessed and honored to have one of your students as a guest on uh, one of our study groups when we were doing Zoom a few, a few years ago. Latoya Sampson. Uh, okay. she is she's very intelligent. Absolutely. She runs a business and she's still uh uh, trying to learn and educate herself so she can further herself in this life. Uh, I was introduced to her through her music. Right. But she runs a, um, a beauty studio right there over on Wabash. And I just wanted to tell you, she speaks very highly of it. And I just wanted to tell you that. And thank no, you I, I appreciate work. it, my brother. No, um, so that was one of my students, uh, class of 2009 at Chicago Vocational, a highly intelligent sister. Uh, absolutely. So I know exactly who you're talking about. Yes, sir. And, you know, you know, brothers and sisters, the, the sad thing is that with all the stuff that you hear about in Chicago, all the everything that's happening with our young people, you would think that somebody would be like, man, is there anybody who actually wants to work with them and change the reality for these young people? And there is. But because I'm a Muslim, then our work is not accepted uh, by those who don't want our children and our people to change. That's we right. Keep fighting for Islam because we know we will surely win. That's right. That's right. And Brother Abdul, you know, on a larger scale, just one thing I wanted to just ask you on a larger scale, as you see the landscape of education and the curriculum uh, that is mm -hmm. given to our children, you know, we all know that this curriculum is, I mean, what would you say about this? Because, I mean, I know we're talking about Chicago, but there is a larger issue. That's a national issue mm -hmm. with education, isn't there? Especially when it comes to educating black children. What right. What is your, what could you help us understand about this system? Well, you know, brother, the, the sad reality is that the system was never designed to serve black children. Black educators get go into the system, like myself, Black educators go into a system that was never designed to serve black children. And we go in the system and we start to serve black children. And I know many of us who are not uh, educators may not understand, but our children are suffering in these schools. And we say, well, brother, just, you know, and I've heard this many times and I'm not opposed to it. You know, well, brother, just open your own school, which that's always an option. You know, but when I talked to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he shared with me, he said, brother, we have to save our children out of the public school system. So that's a reality because that's where the majority of our children are. So when black educators come into the system, the vast majority of them come into a system that don't like black children, but then they're in the system and they're saving the lives of black children. And what, uh, what happens, unfortunately, is that same system at a certain point turns on that black educator. So when I was on the phone recently with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, like I told you all, 
this brother and this man has been uh, guiding me and reaching out to me the entire time that I've been going through this ordeal with Limbloom. And we were on the phone uh, recently and he said, brother, either we change the system mm. for black and brown, right? Or the system has to be destroyed. Mm. And that's where we are. Either, either we're going to change it. No, here's what he said. We change the system to benefit everybody with a focus on the black and the brown or the system has to be destroyed. Mm. So when we sit down in every city and we're talking about education of children, black, brown, red, yellow, and white, the demand needs to be that we change this system where it benefits everyone, where everyone is treated with freedom, justice, and equality and properly educated. And if we can't do that, then the system needs to be destroyed. And we can take our tax dollars that you're stealing because we're paying taxes, but we're not getting what we paid for. We can take our tax dollars that you're stealing and then we can build something separate and independent for the children that want to be properly educated. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Uh, brother, student minister, you have any more questions? I'll just ask him uh, if not to just end with the message to his supporters uh as we fight for your reinstatement um but student minister if you have any other questions on on top of that oh no sir i do not uh brother represented not only himself i would only say to brother student minister abdul brother the things you shared tonight and what I've known about you, period, over the years, you truly, for someone to say what you said earlier about yourself without it coming across as right. egotistical or braggadocious, the way you just did that, made me to understand that you can speak up for yourself in the eye, but yet the way you did it, mm -hmm. it came across just like it came across. Yes, sir. This That's is the helpful. fact, the truth. And because you said you stood on the principles of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that should give all of us the understanding that you have to defend yourself if there's a wrong done without fearing come on that this is some egotistical i'm this i'm that and the way you put it out there it just blew all that away yes sir for us to see yes sir this is a man that sincerely loves our people and our children and mm -hmm. he's just being persecuted right absolutely and and i'll say this uh brother minister Donnell. you know brother you know all I care about is doing the work. Uh, all of these honors and all that. I never like. I'm not sitting around like I live in Chicago. The brothers, if you talk to the brothers, man, does he go around bragging about that? Nah, absolutely not. All of that, all of those awards and all of that stuff. That stuff sat in a drawer. I never even looked at it. I I had to pull it out when they started to persecute me because now I have to tell my own story. That's right. True. Because they're not telling the story. They're trying to frame yeah me in such a way as they do with the honorable minister lewis farrakhan right, right. Mm -hmm. they try to you know they they try to erase this man's work as they do with the most honorable elijah muhammad they try to erase mm -hmm. his 44 years of work so brother i could not let them do that and right. um i had you know i never was a brother that quote unquote tooted my own horn but what i had to do was set the record straight because a liar was misrepresenting me to the public and That's I could right. not allow that to happen. So, and I got to say this before I get off, uh, definitely want you all to go on justice for abdulmohammed.com and sign the petition, email the mayor and make a donation if you so choose. But when this first, when this thing happened on uh, March 31st, you know, my name was all over the news, right? Uh, Abdul Muhammad, Abdul Muhammad and the way they put it out there was so foul. Right. Abdul Muhammad. This is all over the news in Chicago. 
mm-hmm. removed from limb bloom on substantiated findings like you know and you could just they left mm-hmm. it open for assumptions right right so now i'm not just clearing my name because my name is muhammad right but mm-hmm. our name is muhammad right right that's right but god's name is muhammad right so i'm not gonna let them throw dirt on God's name, and I don't stand up for God when I know I didn't do anything wrong. You're not gonna put the name Muhammad down when That's I worked right. 25 years to make sure that the name Muhammad was respected in Chicago public schools, right? And in this city, <clears throat> I can't allow you to do that, right? That's right. And I think you said the minister told you. Your name, your reputation is all you got. It's all you got is your reputation. He said, everything that a man has will he give for his life and his good name. So all of us should fight because it's not just my fight. You're right. They they, they attacked me because I'm representing you. Right. That's right. right. And if if, if we let them get away with it, if we let them get away with it to you, then we're next. We're absolutely That's right. how it goes. So, brothers and sisters, we have to fight. The the people have to understand that when they attack one of us, That's right. they attack all of us. That's and I right. I paint this picture on all the shows, all the blogs that I go on. We saw that fight in Alabama where yep. the, the white man disrespected the brother who at the dock, right? They right, parked right. the boat. And the white man was disrespectful to the brother that was just trying to do his job. <laughs> That's right. And then they stole off on the brother, right? Right. And black people came from everywhere and a big fight broke out. And when black people saw us standing together, mm. we celebrated it all over the country, all over the world. Some of us started wearing folding chairs around our neck, folding chair, right. chair keychains and all this kind of stuff, right? And we found the, the black inventor of the folding chair and put him as our Facebook picture and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So now... We celebrated a fight because black people joined the fight and defended themselves. But that was a fight over something minor. Mm-hmm. What we're fighting for is the education of our children, the right, minds right. of black children, which is the greatest fight that we can be involved in. Right. And if if you say, man, I'm your brother, Abdul, if you saw, if I'm standing on the corner with the final call, trying to give light to the people and seven white people and one black person try to stomp me out on the corner. Mm. Would you stand there and say, man, I hope that brother been training, man. Mm. I, I wonder what he did to make those seven white people and that one black person jump on him. I'll pull out my iPhone, take a video, put it on Facebook. Right. <laughs> so if, if that's our response, right. As Muslims, that's not the right response. That's right. If we see our, if our brother is attacked, then we are attacked. Right. And so this is not a physical attack, right? They didn't attack me physically. Right. But it's greater than a physical attack because they're attacking with lies and falsehood. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of us should stand up and we should fight back. We should email Brandon Johnson, the mayor. We should take these videos and post them on Twitter, post them on Facebook, uh, spread the petition, because me clearing my name, which I'm going to do, I love the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, listen to what he said when I was with him on June 19th. He said, brother, Allah is going to clear me of all the false charges, just like he's going to clear you. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we already the victory is already ours. Right. All we got to do is step in the ring and join the fight. So don't just have me standing out there fighting seven white people and one black person who coming with lies and falsehood. We want y'all to join the fight. Go on the website, repost the videos on Twitter, Facebook, spread the petition, spread what's going on, so that other people can join this fight against these lies and falsehood spread on uh me from chicago public school so i just want to end with that you can get all yes, that information sir. at justice for abdulmohammed.com i want to thank you all for having me on uh i definitely appreciate it and thank uh, you brother listeners for the great questions i want to thank um brother marcel 
for sharing this uh holy quran uh verse i do intend to read it uh once we log off thank you all very much thank you my yes, brother sir. thank love you, you brother. much man love you too like you said we got to stand love brother. you brother because we, remember that little story the messages used to tell about the you know when they came for the jews they came for the enemy they came for right as soon as you said it's not my fight that's right. when they come for you you ain't got nobody to help you because you didn't stand for the, nobody else but yourself so that's there you right. go that's right all right that's right all right and so i'll go ahead and so thank you brothers for watching um we definitely want you to go and support as you can see it right on the screen justice for abdul muhammad.com go and, and and read about this and then donate whatever you may have a dollar five dollars ten dollars a hundred dollars or whatever god blesses you to be able to give give because the, the fight is bigger than just our brother the fight is about as he said the education of our of our children and That's we right. gotta take a stand somewhere right so let us take a stand with our brother because if you got a brother like that on the battlefield and he taking the, the the tip of the spear and you see what he's been doing, then we got we got the victory already. You yes, need to sir. be on the board and be on in that victory. Yes, but I want to close out with our brother talking at that press conference, and it was a powerful press conference. So I'm going to play, just play ten minutes of it with our brother speaking, and come back every Sunday at seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time where we bring on our brothers and our sisters who go into just beautiful and inspiring messages. So let's go ahead and uh, play this uh, 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 conference. My name is Abdul Muhammad. Mm -hmm. I am the former principal of Lim Bloom Math and Science Academy. The rightful I principal. Right. Do I need to change keep, keep, no, keep the mic off. I am the former principal of Lim Bloom Math and Science Academy. I've been an educator for 29 years. My entire adult life wow. has been dedicated to black children. Yeah, right. yeah. I've been in Chicago public schools for 25 years. I won the Teacher of the Year Award. My wife was there. This is my wife, y'all. Couldn't have done it without her. I won the Teacher of the Year Award for the city of Chicago. I was featured in Who's Who among American high school teachers for four or five consecutive years. I was nominated twice for the Golden Apple Award. So, the, so I'm not. I'm saying this because I'm not a stranger to Chicago public schools. Right. Yes, sir. Everywhere I have gone, because of the love that I have for the children, uh -huh. everywhere that I've gone, and they're through the streets of Chicago to this day. Children love Mr. Muhammad. That's right. That's right. I go into the That's schools right. and there's fights every day and I go in there and build relationships with the students and the fights decrease. That's right. This is my track record in Chicago public That's schools. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, when I first became an administrator, I started at Percy L. Julian High School. That's right. And at Percy L. Julian, there were fights almost every single day. Right. Mm -hmm. right. By the time I left Percy L. Julian, I could stand in the hallway by myself and count down from 10 and the students would rush to the classroom. Yes, Not because I intimidated them, because they knew I loved them yeah. and they didn't want to disappoint yeah. me. Yeah. 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 My so we brought the fights at Percy L. Julian all the way down, but then we brought the academics all the way up. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. When I left Percy L. Julian, I went to Nancy B. Jefferson. Now you don't, many of you don't know, that's the school that's inside the juvenile detention right. center. Come on, tell us the children call it the Audi Homes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was the assistant principal in the school in the juvenile detention center. 85% black males locked up. All the people that you hear about that are shooting, all that you hear about, they got to go somewhere when they get arrested. Uh -huh. They had to come see Principal Muhammad. Uh -huh. And I built such strong relationships with these young brothers that this was the first time that they could put them all in a room together, the GDs, the BDs, the Vice Lords, the Four Corner Hustlers, the Black Souls, the Latin Kings, the EBK. They could put them all in a room. Wow. wow. And it wouldn't be a fight. Wow. Not because I intimidated them, but because I loved them. Right, right. So now, this is my track record that CPS is well aware of. And even though I haven't been to the detention center as the as assistant principal, 
for over seven years because I'm dedicated to the children in the city of Chicago. I've been back, and some of you here can bear me witness, at least 50 times since I left. That's right. Because I'm committed to the children, right. not right. committed right. to a job. Right. So now, when I left Nancy B. Jefferson, I was selected to be the principal at Frederick Douglass High School. And when I got to Frederick Douglass, uh -huh. that's my LSE community rep, she knows. Yeah. When I got to Frederick Douglass, anything that you could name that could be wrong with a school was <laughs> wrong with the school. And I'm not putting anybody down. Frederick Douglass was neglected because it was one of the smaller schools in Chicago. So it was neglected by the district. But what Frederick Douglass needed was love and attention. Right, and right. that's exactly what I gave those students that's right. and the Austin community. In the five years that I was at Frederick Douglass, we brought the attendance rate that was in the 70s all the way up to 85%. The graduation rate, which was in the 70s, went to the district average of 82%, wow. where they were fighting every day because the school was neglected at Frederick Douglass. It was a thorn in the side of Chicago public schools because nobody could go there and get the school under control. But I went there and was blessed to minimize the fights, right. to bring the academics up. I'm only giving y'all my track record. From there, I moved to Limbloom. And as a veteran educator, I applied for the principal's position at Limbloom High School. There were 11 dates that also applied, 11 uh, candidates that the LSC, the ALSC was looking at. Uh -huh. Of those 11, they narrowed it down to two, myself and another candidate. The day of the forum, which was June 15th, the other candidate dropped out of the, 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 uh, the bid to be the principal of Limbloom. So I was the sole candidate. I came to the forum. They informed me, well, you're the only candidate. Will you go forward? I said, yes. I, did, I answered every question in the forum. It was a two-hour forum. Anybody who's familiar, all of you journalists who do these investigations, the video of the forum is on the Limbloom website. They never announced who the uh, principal was at the end of that forum. It's a public forum. They're supposed to announce at the end, we have selected this person to be our principal. That announcement was never made. I didn't know why, it, at that time, I didn't know why it wasn't made, but I know now. It's because Kinshasa Ford and Devin LaRosa were working behind the scenes to prevent me from being the rightfully elected right. by the LSC. Right. They were trying to prevent me from being the principal at Limbloom High School. So a few days later, I got an email. I was, I was selected by email, not in a public forum. Oh. Wow. I got an email from Ms. White. So Thank now, you, White. this is how deep the rabbit hole goes. So uh, I was at Limbloom uh, for eight months before I was removed. When I got to Limbloom, as any good principal would do, you take an assessment of where the school is. And uh, one of the things that I found out was that monies were not being turned in. And uh, there were several teachers that did not turn in money from fundraisers and sporting events. One, her name was Christina Davis, who was the athletic director. And when I found out the money wasn't being turned in, I went directly to her and had a private meeting and inquired about the money that was not being turned in. Uh -oh. uh, to make a long story short, uh, Miss Davis uh, took the money out of her bank account and brought it back to the school, uh -oh. and put it, and we put it in the school's bank account. Right. But because she was corrected for something that could have caused her to lose her job, she, according to her words, became the ring leader. These are her words, not mine. She told it to one of the parents who was here, wow. Brother Omari. She said that she is the ring leader of the opposition against the principal. Wow. So Ms. Davis and six other white teachers told all manner of lies to the CPS law department that Mr. Devin LaRosa agreed with that Ke Kelly Tarrant did not properly investigate. And on March 31st, I was removed from Lynn Bloom High School. And my last point is this, no due process. every right. day, we talk about the children in Chicago. When they come downtown, we have something to say. When they, when they do something wrong, we have right, something to right, say. Right, and right, the constant right, refrain right, right. is, 
Is there anybody who can do something about these right. children? And Chicago Public Schools is working against the very ones that can right. do something yeah. about right. the children right. that we all say we care about. Right. Thank you.